Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Beyond Room 313 Symposium. I know it's been a while, but we've all been very busy. But, you know, like uh, anything to do with abstinence and taking your time and staying away from something, it's always great when you get back to it. And we have an amazing guest with us tonight. Uh, thanks to Timony who brought it in. I'd also like to say hello, Jace is not feeling well, so he's manning the controls from his, his sick bed. But anyway, Jason and Timony set this up, and Timony is going to formally introduce our esteemed guest, Brad. Yes, I was going to use that very same terminology. We do have a very lovely esteemed guest today, Brad Olson. Welcome to the Beyond Room 313 Symposium. Uh, Brad Olson uh, has been interviewed on the hit history channel series, Ancient Aliens. He's been on for two episodes in season six. Uh, he has commentaries that which, which have appeared on Coast to Coast AM, National Public Radio, CNN, the X-Zone, Buzzsaw, and the Travel Channel. Uh, Brad enjoys public speaking on travel to sacred places, the mystery of esoteric subjects, and extended global explorations. He has also photographed and written the script for two dozen visual travel tours. Welcome, Brad. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Uh, real pleasure to be here. Yeah. Esteemed guest. Yeah. <laughs> Esteemed, very. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about your, um, is it the, the Modern Esoteric Series? Well, Esoteric Series has three books in it. It okay. starts with Modern Esoteric, Future Esoteric, and the, uh, my latest, Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet. Okay. Kit, yeah, you want to talk, talk to us a little bit about those? I know... Um, you do cover a lot of esoteric America, which is a subject I'm very interested in, and I know Thomas is too, and it's been covered very little. So I'm glad to see that that you're out there actually covering these topics. Yeah, and I did a book called Sacred Places, North America, 108 Destinations. And while this is mainly geared as a travel guide to help people discover these locations, it did introduce me into this world of esoteric subjects, which literally just means that which has been withheld from humanity or uh, collected by a select few. And now in the era of the Great Awakening, so many of these subjects are becoming known. That is, if you're interested in them, if you're willing to uh, do a little legwork to find them out, in which I am, and I did, and I put into this three book series uh, of esoteric subjects and uh, been finding people like you guys who are also very interested in this subject. And I love the room 313 reference to Wee Weaselberg Castle, which just showed uh, you and Thomas during the setup is in my Beyond Esoteric book, it's a very major part of the occult history of the SS and the Nazi party. So really when you start peeling the layers off the onion of these subjects, you just oftentimes get more questions than answers, but at least it does provide insight into a lot of the machinations of what's going on in the world today and how the elite have really fostered these subjects in, and used them in their own way and in, in really the control and, and uh, domination of the Western world. Yeah, I always found it fascinating. I've written a book on the, the, the subject myself. I often found it fascinating how the Library of Congress sees the, uh, the what was available in 1945, but they found in Nuremberg of the actual SS esoteric documents, occult documents. So, and this, they also did the same in 1990, believe it or not, when the Soviet Union fell, the Soros Foundation took the stuff over. So it just goes to show you that they tell the rest of us it's bunk and it's, it's, it's nonsense, but they themselves can't get enough of it. <laughs> That's such a good point, Thomas, because really everything they tell us is bunk is really what they don't want us to learn about. And uh, also the Rockefeller Foundation, yeah, those guys that are involved, uh, their fingers in so many different aspects of society, they commissioned the entire rewriting of World War II including the Thule Society, uh, the, before that the Vril Society, and then the Ananurbe, which were this uh, all uh, looking for all the relics around the world. So remember the movie uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? They're doing a, a big dig in Egypt, and 
that was really true. They had excavation yeah. teams all over the place, uh, even outside of of Europe and the Middle East and Tibet and uh, far flung places in South America. They were just looking for any kind of relic that could give them the uh, power and strength to win against uh, the rest of the world. And they got very, very close. I'll tell you a very interesting story here in Ireland, not far from where I live. And I, I don't know, it's, it put it this way, it's one that sounds completely true. And, but I, it's hard to, to get the proof, but you find this interesting. There was a mountain here called Iron Mountain. It was obviously for our reasons, it was in County Leitrim, not far. And it was big iron deposits. In the 1930s, a German uh, mining company under the, you know, said they were a mining company, came to the village and said, we will open up a mine and, uh, but we have to do a geosurvey of the mine to see if it's up the mountain side, to see if it's uh, valid. They, went, they brought on some equipment and they vanished overnight and they took with them several Neolithic standing stones that had been on the mountain that had inscriptions and carvings on them. They basically set up a front. This is like classic what you're saying. They went everywhere, claiming it was a mining operation that they were speculating for, what they were using as a cover story to steal these, uh, these megaliths that had inscriptions on them going back 5,000 years, whatever, and haven't been seen ever since. So there you go. God only knows if what they got up to that we'll never know about. Yeah, they were really into all this uh, type of research and findings and artifacts with the Ananurbe Society. A lot of people have never even heard of this. I, I do a, a, a section on Nazism and the occult in this book and was really fascinated when I was researching this, that Anna Nerby Society was the first and the last state-sponsored occult research by a Western country, the first and the last. So they were really into this and put a lot of resources into it. Uh, in the end, this belief in the occult and what we would think of as superstition actually lost them the war. The, uh, the different soothsayers and, and uh, tea leaf readers, I say it because I'm, I'm very skeptical on some of their um, beliefs on, on how this would work. And, and indeed they were, uh, Hitler himself, he was from the Thule Society with Himmler and and Hess and several other high-ranking Nazis that came dominant in the Third Reich, but they um, were, were listening to the different people who were telling them, for example, that Operation Barboza, Barbarossa that would invade Russia would be a very mild winter. And so they didn't even give the army winter clothes. So yeah. they, they, they believe this to the extent that it cost them dearly in the Russian campaign and elsewhere. So finally, they outlawed it and said, OK, all this stuff is illegal and send these guys to the gulag or to the concentration camps. But uh, they, the Gestapo went on an actual murder spree at the end of them. They, they took a lot of the, the, myst this, the sort of mystical ones out and took them out in the field and shot them. This kind of a lot of this kind of thing went on. It's a tremendously in interesting subject. I personally can't get enough of because every year there's a new, rev as you know yourself, a new revelation appears. But it's it, the whole thing, like we're saying about the, the act, they can actually still go to the office in Berlin where the armament was. They changed the name for like something like the, the, I don't know, the Council on, you know, Paranormal Researchers. They gave it a more kind of a, a metaphysical, a more kind of a respectable name. But the thing was a, an office you know, they make it sound like it was a little small department. I th the late 1930s, it was something like an office with 40 people working in it. I mean, that's a serious resource to dedicate to Wu, you know, and that's how much it meant to them. Yeah. Uh, as you guys might know, I was down in South America three years ago and was down there for four months, including a trip to Antarctica on a sailboat, uh, looking into all these mysteries that we've heard so much about of Antarctica. But while I was there, a big news story broke. There was a big cache of uh, authentic Nazi relics valued in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. 
uh, there is a lot of sympathy for the Nazi cause. And that's why in Future Esoteric, the second book, I have a chapter called The Fourth Reich in America. And of course, that Americas include South America. Yeah. Uh, I, I went to uh, San Carlos de Bariloche, which I have been to Germany many times, was like walking into a Bavarian village. I mean, it was just uncanny. And, and Hitler had a uh, home near there on the lake. Um, went to this other location called La Falda, right above Cordoba, which was the Detroit of South America, which was just blossoming with uh, factories pumping out. And Argentina should have been like the next Japan, but yeah. they were, but they were infected with this fascism, this this neo fascism. Uh, Juan Perón, he was yeah. corrupt as hell, and. Uh, but he supported these guys. He supported the Nazis and, and allowed the rat lines through the Vatican and the Red Cross for these guys to come there with, um, with new papers, new identities, uh, bank account. Martin Borman, the money man, he kept popping up all over South America in the 1950s. So it, it, there's a whole uh, History Channel show called Hunting Hitler. And I do believe he survived the war. Yeah, they me just, too. Uh, killed yeah. a doppelganger and got him out. Yeah, I, I, the, I, that was the wonder weapon to get him out. That's mm -hmm. what I, I often think that was the, the wonder weapon. That was the, the weapon to get him out. The, I'll tell you a spooky story about when my book, Val Purgis Night, came out on the NASA esoteric thing in 2014, my website got hundreds and hundreds of hits from South America. Like, I felt like, you know, someone was watching, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, like, now, you, now that you tell me that, it's hardly surprising, is it? It's hardly surprising at all. Uh, tell me about, uh, yeah, I do believe that the, that Hitler on Valpurgis night actually made it down to, he got out at the end. Uh, do you have any, I'd love to hear more about that if you have any theories on that. Yeah, sure. So I went to this town called La Falda, again, Bavarian hill town. There's, a, there's another mountain range in South America nobody knows about it. So it's it's kind of like the... Uh, Ozarks in North America. It's another real old mountain range. And on the top, uh, and there's also all these UFO sightings um, in, in a nearby mountain. And my good friend, David Hatcher Childress, who's on Ancient Aliens, way more than I ever was. He's on almost every episode. He and I uh, talk about this quite a bit. And he knows that I went to this little town and he goes, oh yeah, Brad, uh, all these UFO sightings near there, it's not aliens, it was the Nazi. And he said they had a, <clears throat> a big uh, underground base there and I, I believe him now. And it's so funny because I'm flipping through the uh, Lonely Planet and we're checking things out and they're talking about all the UFO sightings near there and stuff. And right next door is this German town. And so I did the tour of the, the uh, Eden Hotel. And it was owned by this family who were very sympathetic to the Nazi cause. They had gone to the big Nuremberg rallies and pictures of them having dinner, the inner circle with Adolf Hitler. And I took the tour and, and the tour guide, he spoke English pretty well. And, and after the tour, I said, do you really think Hitler survived the war? And he goes, oh, I know he did. I said, how do you know that? He said, oh, this right here in town, there's an elderly woman who was a chambermaid and she has taken lie detector tests and she has uh, passed them every time and she has seen him. Wow. <laughs> and so, yeah, and, and, they, and they featured her on the Hunting Hitler episode as well. And so there are living people still that remember them being yeah. there after the war. And, and so... <clears throat> they had all kinds of flop houses and ways to escape. And so including the, um, the house on uh, the lake near Bariloche, Hunting Hitler did several episodes where they, you, you can't get in there. I tried too. And, and it's all in a very dense forest area, gated community, but they went via the water and there was the ramp for a seaplane. So if, the Argentinians ever were moving in on them. They just jump in the seaplane, fly right over the crest of the Andes Mountains into Chile. And there you have another fascist dictator 
named Pinochet. So yep. they really hedged their bets. And this is why I think the, the Fourth Reich survived and even thrived after World War II. And they were largely responsible for planning the flames of discontent during the Cold War as well. So part of these esoteric subjects <clears throat> is the history that we've never been told. You remember that movie that came out? I think it was the late '80s. Uh, the Boys from Brazil, oh, and yeah. it was yeah. So I was like it, mid mid '70s, really mid '70s. Old. Okay, yeah. yeah. So and, and in in that the theory that they're kind of toying with is that you know they all went down to I think it was Argentina or Brazil, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And and clones Hitler, and so there's like a bunch of Hitler clones all running around now. Yeah, there was a and book so, in, the, in the '70s called The Odessa File. And it was all about the networks through the Vatican, funny enough, uh, through Swift. That's how Mengele got out. It's funny, they saved all the Catholics. And they, yeah, you know, it, it, was, they, it was so fun. The Jesuits looked after all the Catholic Nazis and the Prussian aristocrats looked after all the Protestants. They all had their own little scams to get out. Yeah. Well, you know how uh, art hit, imitates life sometimes. It's not really the boys from Brazil but the big buzz in this field is it was the daughters, not necessarily from Brazil, but the cloned Hitler daughters, including oh. Angela Merkel, the prime. Really? Minister. Oh yeah, and Theresa May, former prime minister of the UK. Uh, well, there's some Easter eggs. I don't know the veracity of this, but this is the the thinking that these were, um, if not clones, but inseminated. Right. With his DNA that they did really have this concept that we have to keep this whole lineage alive. Well, it's so true what you say about the obliterate history to give. And that's part of the, the obliterate what happened and they give you a new history. Now, if you ask anybody today about the Prussians, what, what were the Prussians? And they go, wasn't that something to do with Germany? The Prussians were the empire in Europe at one time. They yeah, basically yeah. dissolved themselves into everything else including the British Royal. If you go to like uh, Darmstadt in Germany, you see them and the Hessians, how the powerful they were to, in their fingers and everything in the world. But yet you hear about the French Empire, you hear about the British Empire, Spanish Empire, you never hear about the Prussians. And that's because they're sort of like the puppet masses behind the strings. I think Every I've only ever heard of the Prussians from you, Thomas. I think that was maybe, maybe I've heard amazing. about it, but as far as any history and context goes, I've only ever heard about that from you. Yeah, I hit, hit that a po at a painting of Frederick the Great in, in the bunker at the very end and it vanished with him. And I always think that that was almost like the code word that the painting went with him was to say, I got away. Damn. The Prussians Damn. arranged it. Brad, when you said, well, you um, know, but... oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, you go ahead. I was going to say, when you said uh, that there was um, a Nazi cache, was that was down in Antarctica? No, no, no. That was in Argentina. Argentina. Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, Buenos Aires. And it was just a big news story at the time I was there three years ago. Uh, but it was, it was all kinds of war memorabilia, but also medals and uniforms. And Did you get to see any of that? Of I did not, I just saw the news story and it, but it was all museum worthy, but in someone's private bunker that they finally uh, discovered. Interesting. How that story goes. I had well, all that down there. Oh, well, yeah, right. Well, sympathetic Nazis, that's how. And right. they have their own version of Operation Paperclip too. I mean, the Argentinian Air Force was the best Air Force in the world in the 1940s and early 50s because all the fellows who'd worked in the Luftwaffe developing the jets all went to work with the Argentinian Air Force. Really quite remarkable. It was just the whole thing just packed up and moved like a traveling roadshow down to South America or to NASA. Oh, yeah, it did. Yeah. It really did. Oh, and then again, in The Lonely Planet, I'd be reading about uh, some little mining town in uh, Bolivia. Oh, uh, Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon. Yeah, he escaped justice and he lived out the rest of his life behind this uh, sawmill in Bolivia. I mean, it's even in the Lonely Planet, they'll tell you about the escaped Nazis. I think they let a lot of them go deliberately because these people had information that was useful to, to everybody. And they may have, you know, basically, if you look at who they killed at Nuremberg, at home at Nuremberg, they were disposables. You know, yeah. they were like civil servants and this kind of thing, yeah. 
Well, and uh, uh, last week, Thomas, you made that really great connection with uh, Himmler being a Mason. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, my own research has led me to believe that Himmler got away as well. This is why he was acting so cocky and arrogant at the end and looking for British Freemasons because he was probably a lodge brother himself behind all his other stuff. And uh, I don't believe that. I mean, there's a, there's a guy called Mark uh, Fenton or Fulton or something. He runs in a very good World War II sort of snippet show. And he even like he tried to debunk that it wasn't Himmler. Or it wasn't a, the conspiracy wasn't true, but he didn't really. I think that that was a stu- some. It was the night before he ke- allegedly killed himself. He was drinking and, dr- and 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 hanging out and laughing and joking with these two British officers. It sounded so masonic, you know. And then the next thing, this his body found. Oh, he killed himself, you know. And they had he'd been set, searched by two nurses who found no sign of capsule on him. So I think a lot of them got away like that. Even the ones we thought were dead, they got away. Yep, absolutely. And they were given cover stories, uh, just like uh, Martin Borman. Oh yeah, we found his remains in the 1970s when they were doing an excavation for a new railroad terminal. How do you know it's him? What did you have to compare it on? So these yeah. things, yeah, the, the cover story is often more ridiculous than just saying, well, what if? And we know that uh, the royal family, the Windsor, was just a name they gave themselves. They named themselves after another uh, castle. Yeah, really Sa- Saxe Coburg and uh, yeah, Saxe Sachs- Coburg and Goethe and the other side of the family were Battenberg, and it was they became Mount Batten and Windsor. Not during World War One, and in fact, they were in, when, during World War One they were still all speaking German inside Buckingham Palace. Yeah, you know, it's just unbelievable. You know, <laughs> that's why. Hess flew the plane to Scotland to try to ensue for peace and why Hitler didn't bomb all the Brits in uh, the Battle of Dunkirk. It could have just ended the whole Western resistance right then and there. He let them all escape because yep. he always thought we're not going to, they're, they're part of us, the Aryans, we're not going to, we want to bring them into the fold kind of thing. But of course, it didn't work out that way. Yeah, they, we thought he'd curry favor with the, with the, English, the British government if he let the soldiers go but uh, it wasn't to be it wasn't to be and i often wonder why you know a lot of the aristocrats in britain wanted a kind of a an arrangement with the third reich to like stop the war and yet it didn't happen i often wonder what and i haven't got a clue really. maybe you know about this maybe you would have a better idea than me but i i couldn't i can never figure out the force that was in britain was it the pressure by the u.s government or whatever or the french government to keep them at war because Britain was badly damaged in the first three or four years of the war, very badly damaged. Well, I think it was Winston Churchill mainly who yeah. was the driving force. Um, the do you remember in the movie The King's Speech, the the stuttering king? He was the second born. He should not have been the king. The first born king was very sympathetic to the Nazi cause and wanted them to move over. Yeah. And he actually was banished. Um, for the rest of his life in, in Bermuda, I believe. Yeah, it's what him and his uh, American wife were just on um, some of the yeah. some of the some of the things that speeches they gave. If you, they're unbelievable. Uh, they're just pure, like straight out of the the worst SS propaganda. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So being uh, Winston Churchill, saying, being a military <laughs> man, I think he said, "Hey, look, we got this English Channel waterway that's going to protect us." Um, and let's just hold out as long as we can. And the longer they held out, once America was brought into war. Another little esoteric point of history, I'm sure you know this, Thomas, is that they knew that uh, Pearl Harbor was going to happen. And Winston Churchill, once again, told FDR, just hold off, hold off, hold off, let them do it. And of course, great loss of American life which could have been prevented. <clears throat> well, but, uh, Churchill was a canny, he was a, nasty, a bad a piece of work, really. I mean, the way he destroyed the French Navy in Marseille and killed all those French so- sailors just because he didn't want the fleet to fall into the hand of the Nazis. I mean, this, that would be a war crime, any other war, but he got away with it because of, like you said, they get to own history. Yeah. <clears throat> they get to own history, and I think when the real history is revealed, we're going to see that they're all banker wars to begin with. And so 
just like Britain always sided with the underdog in Europe, um, backing the forces against Napoleon and the Battle of Waterloo. Of course, that was uh, Lord Wellington that won that war, that battle. And who had their spies in the Battle of Waterloo? But the Rothschild bankers who got that news sooner than the public did. And they basically uh, gamed the stock market to the point where they were able to buy the uh, Bank of England. And yep. this set up the very first central bank. So there's a great documentary called All Wars Are Banker Wars. And you can see how they pit, pit opponents against each other. And of course, loan the money at interest for those war machines. It, it's a very good business model if you're a, a central banker, but uh, terrible for the rest of us. Wellington Lord Wesley, this was his real name. He was actually Irish and he was promised yeah. prime minister job of Britain when it all was over so he was in on it too but the show like the, the nature of these people when the battle of waterloo was over and thousands were dead one of his generals said to him you know well we won today our, 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 our troops delivered a fine victory and wellington just went scum of the earth his own troops who died in the battle mm -hmm. this is the kind of the arrogance that these aristocrats have it's 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 beyond psychopathic it's almost like they're a different species or something you know because they own the news media and have for literally centuries they control the narrative and really it's the narrative that is more important than anything else so when we're seeing the whole narrative starting to break down and people are questioning it that's a really good sign that oh, the yeah. uh the real iron grip of information is starting to fall apart oh big time and you know something uh with the current thing that's went on the last 22 months we can't talk about it because youtube will censor us but you know what i'm talking about the, mm -hmm. the holocaust whatever you want to call it that right yeah. this thing this thing has the, the, they, were, they pin so much on calling people conspiracy theorists and guess what's right. happened it turned around and people are now saying everywhere the conspiracy theorists were right you're welcome. This has, this has changed everything because they can never use that slur ever again. In fact, it's got people who thought we might have been eccentric or nuts or interested in these subjects, which was weird, are now, hmm, aren't they contacting me all the time? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite amazing. It is. Brad, I want to talk to you about your experiences down in Antarctica and, and what that was like and what you saw and just how your, uh, your journey down there, how you even got down there. Cause I know it's what 1% of the population has ever been there or will ever go there. Oh, it's much smaller than that. It's about, well, and this was before the whole, uh, 22 months. It's just opened it up again, but for two years, you weren't able to go down there. And only about uh, 300,000 people go down per year, including the scientists. So it's really, uh, I did the calculations once, 0.0002% of the world population has ever been down there. Uh, much smaller it, it, than it, one. It, yeah, much, much smaller than one. It's kind of akin to saying, oh, I've been to the Mars or the moon. Right. Uh, because that's why so many of these theories come about is because it's so inaccessible that uh, it's very hard to verify them just on Google Earth or uh, other accounts. And it's so, so gigantic. It's ginormous. Yeah, it's uh, the fifth largest continent in the world. It's like two Australias combined. Uh, over 99% covered in ice, but it's all the most volcanic continent. There's 91 known volcanoes, um, some of which I visited and saw, including Deception Island, which is a active volcano caldera that we sailed into. And there are still some bases there and old uh, whaling uh, processing plants that have been destroyed by uh, subsequent volcanic activity. But it, so uh, where I went was, um, so we went, we, I, I bought a car, I bought a Ford Expedition and sold it, bought it and sold it in South America. But it was a great way to, to travel around and went all the way down to the southern tip of South America, the southernmost city of the world called Ushuaia, Argentina. Is that Patagonia? 
uh, it's actually south of Patagonia. Patagonia yeah, is the landmass of South America. And then it's Terra del Fuego, yeah. ah. which is a big island at the very bottom and split between Chile and Argentina. Okay. And so 90% um, of all the boat traffic that goes to Antarctica leaves from Ushuaia. So uh, my partner at the time and I were uh, originally looking at getting on a cruise ship because a lot of cruise ships come in and out of there during the season, which is now, which is opposite season. So it's summer down there now. And then we got the tip that, uh, hey, maybe if you guys want to spend a little bit longer, you should take a sailboat down there. <laughs> so we went to the other pier where the uh, sailboats were going and we met a ship that had room for two and we got on and paid the passage and 26 days on a sailboat crossing oh the Great Passage, which is the stormiest sea was in the world. Was that just mine? How was that to get there on a sailboat? Uh, it, it was treacherous to say the least. We both got violently ill, um, throwing up for three days, seasickness. So what I'm saying is getting down there was not glamorous whatsoever. But once we were there, it was pretty smooth sailing through the different channels and the islands and then the Palmer Peninsula. So it's, if you know the map, it's uh, the Southern tip of Argentina like that. And then the Palmer Peninsula coming up like the other finger. And so we had 15 full days there and we went around to um, six different research bases. One of which was one of the British bases that was spying on the Nazis during the whole uh, New Schwabenland colony mm -hmm. of the Nazis. And so I was very interested in all these subjects and, and as well as the p possibility of craft being under the ice or pyramids poking through or excavations okay. going on. So I, I asked everybody that would talk to me if they knew anything about it. And, for the most part, got to know, I just don't know. And I believe that they just don't know. If you go down there as say a marine biologist, well, you study marine biology and you go down there to do your job. You don't, you're not being privy to the information about uh, say, for example, the elite going down there. Now they're going down there again, but in 2016, just a couple of years before I was there, that's when they were all going down there for some reason. And some of them, including Prince Harry, went to the South Pole with a bunch of his army buddies, and they went cross-country skiing uh, to the 89th parallel. That's very significant because that is where the giant rumored hole under the ice is located. And why, why would you ski across the polar plateau? There's absolutely nothing to see or do for a week unless you're going to check this out. And this is where Admiral Byrd said that he saw this giant hole and it was wide enough and big enough that he felt confident to take his plane down into it, circle around and come back out. Uh, and, and one thing I did find out when I was down there is absolutely 100%, there's a big no-fly zone over huh. this section near the South Pole. Yeah, there was another base called the Belgrano II, another Argentinian base that uh, kind of got it out of this marine biologist guy, didn't want to tell me at first that, there, that they had, uh, UFO sighting a few weeks prior. Uh, to when you were there? Yeah. So there is a lot of paranormal activity that's going on down there. And boy, I tell you, if you ever wanted to hide from the rest of the world, that's the place to go because there are just so few people there. So when everybody leaves in March, um, the, the skeleton crew that stays on some of these bases is only a thousand people on the wow. fifth largest continent of the world. So it is really- There's uh, nobody there. Landscape. Yeah, nobody's there. So- Did you need a visa? Did you need a visa to go there? So that's a really interesting story because I've traveled the world. I've been to all seven continents now and uh, usually my passports are all chock full of stamps. In the case of Antarctica, we had to go to the Argentinian Navy and submit our itinerary, uh, where we were going. And it, it's pretty much everybody goes to this section of the Palmer Peninsula. I, I can't say that going inland is uh, that forbidden, but I did talk to 
a company that takes trips down there and you can book a trip to go pretty much anywhere you want. So some of this is um, not necessarily true that it, it's all cordoned off. And, and certainly it's not a flat earth either. I've been there, set yeah. foot on the continent. But so we went to the uh, naval offices. There is a base in Ushuaia. And then we had to go to the customs station, which is right by where all the cruise ships come in. And even though I was stamped into Argentina, I got stamped out of Argentina and did not get stamped in anywhere in Antarctica. Wow. In fact, when we came back 26 days later, we got stamped back into Argentina. So it was like kind of no man's land uh, as far as countries go but that's what antarctica is per the antarctica treaty it is a continent that has been set aside as a, a biosphere uh, like a world park that below the 60 parallel everything is uh, preserved and although there are interests in mining and fishing and other exploitation of the resources so far the antarctica treaty is held and and they haven't been able to do that only research stations are allowed to go and they have uh, no trace policy that if you up and move your base somewhere or you want to close it down, you have to take everything out of there. Nothing gets left behind. And that's a good thing. Yeah, that running, is a good thing. Yeah, running with the more esoteric aspects of down there and thinking of things like the Pierisi map that shows it without ice and so on. I'm a huge fan, well, beyond fan of, of the writer H.P. Lovecraft. And I actually believe the man was a mystic and rather than he was actually channeling information and putting it into fiction. But he has a story called At the Mountains of Madness, which it's actually his best story. It's his biggest story, his longest story, which takes place of a, with a, an, ex, an expedition crew who goes deep into the Antarctic and discovers basically an ancient city. Do you believe that under those ice there things there are easter islands and stonehenges and ancient cities do you believe i have a hunch it's probably true but how do you feel about that i have a hunch that it's true as well do i have the evidence well sort of just recently a whistleblower came to one of my colleagues michael sala who does the exopolitic website and just right after i did an interview with him uh, about a week and a half ago he came out with uh, this new whistleblower information showing an area in New Schwabenland, in the German claim. Now on a globe, you'd see it as Queen Maudland, but it's basically the Antarctica territory directly south of South Africa. And on the Google Earth, <clears throat> and I went there organically, I did it myself using the coordinates and saw it. It had been covered. And I'll tell you, uh, I do... Uh, PowerPoint presentation at conferences called the hidden anomalies of Antarctica and I show a bunch of stuff that I've collected off of Google Earth including areas that are just big white square over it they don't even really take the effort to try to uh, match the terrain you just see the big black white square right <clears throat> so I, I believe this was a location that had been heretofore hidden and now the whistleblower says you can go and see it just like uh, if you look in uh, Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada around Area 51, they have just identified and shown where the S-4 base is, where Bob Lazar worked. So I think maybe this is part of the uh, opening up of the narrative that now Google is feeling the pressure that they have to reveal some of these locations. So the one that uh, Dr. Sala's whistleblower showed was on a rocky plateau and it showed these long lines like a runway, even some buildings, albeit they're still a little blurry, would like to see those get uh, better resolution. But the fact is nobody's seen them since then. And um, they show what we're most likely a base. Now, also in the new Schwabenland area, I have identified locations where there are big domes that you could fly planes into, suggesting underground bases there. And indeed, this is what the Nazis discovered. The whole network of under ice using the uh, volcanism, the hydroelectric 
tapping into that whole idea that you can create electricity, uh, heat under the ice, and this whole network of tunnels and rivers flowing fresh water as well that they could get their U-boats down into. And in Beyond Esoteric, I actually have two of the Nazi maps. This uh, top one is how the U-boats navigated under the ice. In my presentation, I have some slides of what Antarctica would look like without the ice. And there are massive long fjords that go under the ice for hundreds of miles. And you could just think how intrepid those U-boat pilots and sailors were to take their submarines so deep into Antarctica. And that's why I think not only do the elite have hiding places down there, but quite likely some ET races, some malevolent ETs that the Nazis had allied with and were also instrumental in helping them backward engineer their dish-shaped craft, which were seen during the Battle of High Jump with Admiral Byrd again. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and he came back when he was coming back, he, he kind of had uh, loose lips to talk to a Chilean journalist and saying, I don't wanna strike fear in people, but we're confronted with an enemy that has the ability to fly pole to pole at incredible speeds. And look, as far as I know, they've never released any ship that has the ability to fly pole to pole at incredible speeds. And this is 75 years ago. So clearly something's hiding down there. Now to your question, Thomas, about antediluvian civilizations. Well, uh, Corey Good and others have said that they saw excavations going on, that there were megalithic buildings there. And I mentioned uh, pyramids poking through the ice. And so I talked to my contact uh, with the travel company that does custom trips down there, showed him pictures and asked him about this. And he kind of, he just dismissed it. He said, uh, oh, we call that a nun attack. That's just an attractive mountain that pokes through the ice. And I said, well, well, did you ever land there? Did you ever do a sample? Do you ever climb the thing? He's like, no, no, we just fly over it. We see it all the time, but we don't think it's anything special. So there is reason to go down there again and investigate these things. And I yeah. would go down there again. I would check it out. I'd like to go to the new Schwabenland area. In fact, I know where base 211 is located. It's, it's remarkable. 10 years ago, Hillary Clinton made a very strange visit down there that was mm -hmm. out of nowhere. And there wasn't just when she didn't have an official capacity of any office in the government. It was after she was New York State, whatever, and before she joined Obama. And uh, I found out just, just snooping around on the Vatican website that the Vatican had appointed a papal nuncio, which is a, a Vatican ambassador, to Antarctica around the same time. And she stayed with him in his papal nuncio in South America in Buenos Aires before she went. Now, that's, that's just weird by any standards. Like, what is going on? Oh yeah, and that's just one of many. Then you've got uh, Barack Obama right around the same time at the end of his term. He was in Bariloche. And again, this is this very Germanic town in, in Patagonia, uh, but also there were some missing days where they think he went down there. And then John Kerry, who was Secretary of State in 2016 on election day, he should have been up uh, campaigning for his party, which lost to Donald Trump in that election. Where's he? In Antarctica. And he too went missing for several days. I have a, a friend who works at McMurdo and um, the, the, of course, a dignitary such as John Kerry coming down there is gonna create a lot of fervor Big about deal. what's going on. He went, uh, he just went afield. They don't know where he went, but I, I have a pretty good idea and that's Rothschild Island, which is at the Southern end of the Palmer Peninsula. Here's something else that's really interesting. That's right, yeah, there's a Rothschild Island, yeah. yeah. That's right. And yeah, there's their an, own there's Rothschild an Island. And an Omicron Island and a Delta, Delta Island. Delta and Alpha. Yeah, yeah. And coronation <laughs> and Deception Island, which I visited. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. right across from Rothschild Island is the Rockefeller Plateau. And that's where all these uh, scientists went missing for about a week. And I'll tell you, you do not survive a day 
on the top of the the plateau. (laughs) And they went looking for them every day and could not find them. So they clearly went somewhere under the ice on the Rockefeller Plateau. But do you remember about two and a half years ago, there was those big fires in Greece yes. that just spontaneously just started burning out of control. Well, Dabu Seven, who comes up with these credible videos, he's got a video of what I call uh, frequency waves or frequency clouds. You can see it emanating out of Rothschild Island, going straight on up to the Northern Hemisphere to Greece. Boom, all these fires lit up. So this is all part of weather warfare, controlling the weather, the harp arrays. And I have a, a chapter on geoengineering here in, in Beyond Esoteric. So you better believe that they control the weather. In fact, our US Air Force came out with a document called Controlling the Weather by 2025. So they're only two and a half years away from every single weather incident being controlled. That's just conspiracy theory. <laughs> Well, well, let's, well let, tell let, that let, to the patents and all the scientists who worked on it. Yeah, well, let's, right. Let's right. dive deep into the conspiracy theory on Beyond Room 313. We're great believers in there's other beings behind this. We, you know, in the, in the Celtic tradition, you might call them the fairies, the Islamic, the Jinn, the Watikos, North America. It goes on and on and on. And I'm a fair believer in this totally at this stage of my life for lots of reasons and including first-hand encounters, what I believe anyway. And we believe this is actually, I, I'm still not, although I kind of suggest that would be true, or I have no reason to believe it's not true, that they, these, these, these unseen, the others, what I'm going to call them, they impact upon the establishment, the globalists, and almost like a possession. Uh, I know David Icke talk, has made built a career on this kind of thing. I'm, I've never been able to jump into that, although it's, I've had a, always had a belief it's probably true. How do you feel about that, Brad? Well, I'm glad you brought it up, Thomas, because it really is part of the, the big picture here. Uh, you, you know, the uh, Naval Intelligence Officer, William Cooper, mm-hmm. who went on to predict 9-11 before it happened, and uh, he did a big data dump at the uh, UFO Congress in 1989, absolute classic uh, lecture. If anybody hasn't seen it, it's a grainy video, but the audio is there. Is this the William Cooper? William Cooper, yes. Behold a pale horse, William Cooper? After 9-11, yeah. The the guy who was murdered for parking tickets. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, they had a good reason to go after him, right? But he, his, one of his famous lines was, you put the aliens in the middle of this stuff and you get all the answers. And I think he's <laughs> absolutely correct because you do not get the full big picture unless you talk about it. And so you mentioned the gin and, and the fairies and the trickster types. And, and those are like lower fourth dimensional entities that do appear and, and can be summoned This is very important because I think the elite have been doing this for many, many years. Oh, yeah. Bringing these things forth. But um, these are the malevolent ones. These are the the ones who interact uh, largely with people because they're already here. Um, So there is the law of uh, prime directive. We heard that in the Star Trek episode. But it is a real law that uh, the the benevolent ones, the higher ones, the higher frequency ones, they don't directly interact or interfere. Uh, They would prevent a nuclear war, for example. They would prevent us from destroying ourselves, but they wouldn't go in and, uh, say, land on the White House lawn. That's just a myth. But the ones that are already here, just keep this in mind. We've always been conditioned to look at the skies. Oh, extraterrestrials, they're gonna come from from up there. Keep your eyes up there. What about right here below our feet? What about right here in the in the legacy deep underground bases? And this brings us and what does that bring us back to? The vrilia of the 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 animal. It's funny how it all comes full circle. Yeah. There you go. And then, so the third factor to consider are ultra terrestrials, those ETs that have 
the ability to phase in and out of our reality. I mean, so this is why extraterrestrial subjects are very much ex esoteric topics because what we're talking about things is what we have not been able to wrap our head around for a long, long time and has put us at a great disadvantage to these entities, these tricksters that, that like to uh, play their little games with us. And so as a result, only now we're kind of catching up to speed and seeing what they're all about. And I say that we do live in a universe of duality, that there are good and there are bad, and, but by far there are more good than bad, but we're just affected by the ones that are bad, these tricksters who like to uh, come in and are summoned into uh, ceremonies, for example, and, and will show themselves. Yep. And I have a, <clears throat> picture one I'm trying to pull up here in the book to show you a ceremony or, or a magician who is able to uh, summon some of these entities. And look, wouldn't it seem very realistic if, say, the three of us were invited to uh, an Illuminati occult ritual and we're just kind of standing in the background nudging each other like, what is all this? What is this all about? <laughs> That'd but be fun. <laughs> summon something that that did appear and we'd be like oh, holy yeah. shit yeah. yeah here it is so uh my point is they very much believe that their entities are real because they're able to summon them and when they do that and here's the picture uh let's just say you do know the incantations to bring these little fellows forth just like alistair crowley did in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid and a very gray alien looking entity called Lamb came to him and he would say that this entity would help him uh, grow his, uh, the, the people in the OTO and, and so forth and help him in, their, in his endeavors. And so this is called shadowing. So when they do these ceremonies and say you're a new initiate and you've done your blood ceremony and it gives new meaning to uh, a, a blood you know a blood oath that <clears throat> when you do this you are then shadowed by one of these lower fourth dimensional entities so what is it that you want to become rich to become famous to become uh, the, the head of the corporation where you work they will help you do that why do you think all the celebrities are doing this stupid thing? Because they've sold out. They're part of it. And so these entities, if you're in this upper echelon, they will help you achieve your goals. But we all know what happens when you make a deal with the devil and it's a bad thing and <laughs> certainly don't recommend it uh, because you will sell your soul. And I, I you know, I grew up with... Uh, parents who didn't take me to church or anything. I've just learned all this by this kind of research. And what I can tell you is I've come around to realize that this is very real. And the elite have been using this force, as you said, Thomas, in Ireland, you guys recognize them as uh, the fairies. And can I, can and, I interrupt you, can, Brad, just for a second? Are you going to enjoy this? I sent sure. you a file, Have a, if you can open that there, uh, talking about AWAS uh, that Crowley brought forward in Egypt, well, his wife brought forward in Egypt. Uh, you, I don't know if you can see that picture of me with the statue that uh, I should have, I sent it to you, but that we'll put up on the screen later. It looks uncannily like what we're talking about. And this thing is probably about three, maybe 5,000 years old. And it's not far from here. It, uh, it's you know, it could be traces of Atlantis, but this, the, the, the face on the thing is identical to Crowley's a, a lamb or Awas, the same look. So uh, the ancients were, you know, if you can't see it, we'll stick it on the screen later on for the, for the broadcast version. But there you go. It, it, these, these, these guys have been around forever and our ancestors have been well aware of them. Yeah, it, and it really doesn't matter who believes in them or not, it, they do. Right. Yeah, right. This whole concept of Lucifer. Yeah, it sounds like a fairy tale to all of us, but we don't have any direct knowledge or 
visualization, say if we were at this uh, Illuminati ritual and something did manifest, yeah. we're at a disadvantage here, a major disadvantage by not knowing. And, and I think this is the reason why the benevolent ETs have decided to help on behalf of the people of Earth is because we are so incredibly disadvantaged, not only technologically, although the secret space program and all that is starting to catch up, but really on this level, we don't know what an ultra terrestrial is. Have we been taught that in school? No, why do you have to hear it from me? This is so important that we should have all learned this a long time ago, just for our own self-defense, to right. be able to protect ourselves from these things. And, yeah. and they are very much real. And if you, if you blow it off to your own peril, if they do uh, decide to come after you, and, and I've been hit, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a targeted individual. I know what I've seen and felt. And maybe because who I am and bringing forth this information, uh, it has made me a TI, but uh, I'll tell you, I go to conferences and people come up to me and say, I am too. And I said, well, what, what do you do? Nothing but being awakened, yeah. really. It, it's nothing more than just the nail that sticks up, gets pounded back down on this planet. That's yeah. why I call it the prison planet because we are so locked in here, we don't know how to escape, nor do we even know that we're in the prison. So that, that's part of the whole. Uh, Thomas has some really good uh, theories on, on humans traveling into space. Hmm. You mean like the Dogon in Africa and stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, you don't physically need a spaceship to get there. That, right. you know, the, in many of these tribal ancient cultures, I mean, there's that famous scene in the in the um, the right stuff where they're down in Australia by the telescope and the Aborigines are saying, oh, we go there all the time for the moon. And the Dogon in Africa being the most famous. But I also am a firm believer that human beings can't really function in space too long. I believe that that was what, you know, the famous press conference when the, the Apollo astronauts came back and they looked like they were dazzled. I right. think they had a colossal psychedelic experience. And I think even it was Edgar Mitchell even said, if you were to add, you know, you'd need a shaman, a mystic, a priest, a rabbi, a psychiatrist, and it's still and an artist, and it still wouldn't describe what we experienced up there. And I think that that's why they've never went back to the moon and why they've given up on interstellar space exploration for people is because we're not meant to be outside this, this, this realm. I'm a firm believer in that. It falls apart very quickly. Yeah, we're indeed. just not equipped. Yeah, physically, not you know, with, for, and many other reasons too. But yeah, just just physically, we just can't make it out there. When you uh, said uh, when you said benevolent entities, do, do, you, do you have any idea what they would be? Did you have names that oh, were familiar with archetypes? Pleiadians, the Syrians that were connected to the Dogon people, yeah. uh, um, Octurians, um who the Vril Society was connected with, the Aldebaran system. And all of these benevolent ETs are very, very human-like. They might be taller than us. They might have bigger eyes than we do, maybe even elongated hat. But for the most part, they could wear clothes and a uh, hat and sunglasses and walk down our city streets and you would not even know it. Yeah. Um, and if you look at really the long, long history of humans on this planet, we are them and they are us and we're their descendants and we're just the ones that got trapped here on prison planet mm -hmm. and so wouldn't it be the greatest achievement of humanity is if we could reunite with our star family and they want us to succeed they really do at this juncture in human history i really do feel we're at some kind of and i know every generation to an extent thinks this you know, the hippies in the 60s with the age of Aquarius and all. But I really do feel, especially what's happened in the last two years with the whole scandemic thing and everything, I really do feel that we're on the cusp of something truly remarkable. Do you feel that way, Brad? Oh, absolutely. And maybe it was the scandemic, yeah. something that really affected all of our lives. And tell me one person who hasn't been affected one way or another by this whole thing. 
that was really the catalytic event to really make all of us say, hey, wait a minute here. There is something that is so wrong with all this. Yeah. And so this could be the, the great downfall of this, this cabal, this Illuminati network, which has been around for thousands of years. Let me give you an example. Remember in the time of Egypt, the Pharaoh was in a human body, but he was divine. He was a god. He was depicted as such. Then the power shifted up to the Roman Empire, and the Caesar was a living god and was depicted as such. And now you have the Pope who lives in Rome, who has a direct ear to God. So you see, they have always hijacked this whole notion of spirituality in the form of religion. Yeah. And they are the ones who dictate to the rest of us what God and what the divine is and all of that. You know, the kings all had the divine right to rule. Who gave yeah. them that, right? Yeah. So we have just been duped into this whole system into believing what the elite want us to believe. That's why the narrative is what is so vitally important to them. And when that breaks down They're because fucked. of this pandemic, then it's game over for them. And hooray humanity, we win finally. Yeah, I totally believe that. And you're right about the whole thing of the God represent. The, the queen is the Anglican representative of God on right. earth. And the czar was the representative of the Russian Orthodox Church, Church God on earth. So it's just interesting how they, they, they meander between uh, religious leadership and, you know, hereditary bloodlines through royal families. That's another thing, too. Do you believe that these, these certain bloodlines are infected to a degree? Yes, yeah. I like, do. Say, say like, say like the, 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 the prevailing families, the, the Rockefellers, the Astors, all the ones that seem to show over and over again through history. Do you feel that? Time and time again, yeah, you sh I sure do. And, I, and I'll tell you, it is all coming down to the RH bloodline, RH negative blood, which happens to be in my family. You I'm RH negative, yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, you know, the 15% of humans are RH negative. It is a large number, but a lot of those are mixed bloods like my family. So my mom is RH positive. I'm RH positive, but my dad's RH negative. So I could actually have RH negative kids. In my family, my grandmother also married an RH positive blood type. And my second born uncle, after my dad, Uncle Douglas, he died after five days because he was infected by my grandmother's RH negative blood. And this doesn't happen in any other animal on earth. Only when I had human. my son, I had to have the uh, the Rogam. Uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I had to have that shot in case I ever had any other kids so my body wouldn't attack it and kill it. And is he wow. already positive? I don't know. I actually, I don't know. I've never had his blood tested. Mm. But you would do that test anyways, just to, to be careful. So right. my point is this, Thomas, the bloodline families, remember how we call them the blue bloods? Well, that's what happened to my uncle Douglas. His whole body went blue when he was infected because they take their bloodline very seriously. You cannot just marry into the Rothschilds. No effing way. You have to, well, first of all, be royalty. Second of all, be RH negative blood type. All the royal families on planet Earth are RH negative. And they wow. have been since the time of the Egyptians. That what, is the royal bloodline. I've heard Atlantis and other things. What, the, what, what is the origin of this? Well, it is Atlantis. And Edgar Cayce, the great sleeping prophet, even spoke of that, that the survivors of Atlantis went to the areas with the highest amount of RH negative blood types. And that, so that's the Basque region of the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France, also the Celtic region where you're from, also Northern uh, Europe, Germany, where my grandmother's from, Potsdam, Germany, her uh, mother came over. Um, and also the uh, Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Morocco. Yeah, yeah they, they have the fair hair and multicolored eyes, and this is a common trait of RH negative blood types. Well, yeah, the Basque I region, 
is the greatest example that they're over 25% RH negative blood type. The Basque language, the spoken and written language has no relatives in the linguistic uh, tree of life, so to speak. Yeah. It is its own branch that comes out of its own tree. The Basque are completely unique in yeah. Europe and they are the, the bastion of this uh, RH negative blood type. Yeah, the, the Irish language is actually, is now they re, is a weird one, and it probably is closer to Basque as well. So it's, they were That's probably right. the origin, hence all the ancient Irish mythologies of the Gaelic people coming from Spain. And they did, and the DNA actually does prove it now. But the, I met a Berber guy a few years ago in Sri Lanka of all places. He, he looked like you. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. He, yep. could, he could have been from... California or Germany or Scandinavia. It was quite remarkable. You know, Even yeah, he spoke hair. an Arab dialect, yeah. Which you see, of course, red hair is most predominant in the Gaelic, Irish, Celtic Scandinavian area. Yep. Yeah. Which is actually a dying uh, hair color. There are less yeah. redheads per year. It's the only type that's ah, actually that's a tragedy. Uh, yeah. Well, red, redheads are, are, are literally a very rare in Ireland now. That's it. People think that everyone in Ireland is redhead. They're, yeah. they're gone nearly. They're gone. You'd have to, there's so, well, even when Irish people sit see a redheaded person, they would go, oh, look, a redhead. It's, it's nearly vanished here too as well. The blonde has definitely overtaken it. It's very weird. Uh, but yeah. It's like, interbreeding, really. Yeah. Wow. And also the, the Nordic genes. I mean, the Vikings were very dominant here for 300 years. So I think that's become the dominant gene at this stage you know as well as the english as well but yeah it is funny you'd really have to go to scotland or norway to see a lot of redheads now it's just weird uh, how it is like an it's sad to think they're an extinct they're becoming extinct yeah, yeah as a hairdresser that's the hardest color to recreate and make it look natural so is that right gotta keep them that's around all right, you guys, we made it to a little bit past the hour mark. Um, Brad, this was an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for your time this morning. I would love to schedule you back to talk more about the esoteric America side of things. We just didn't really have enough time to encompass everything we wanted. So if you're if you're open to that, I'd love to schedule you again. Yeah, you bet. You guys are really wonderful. This hour went by like a snap of the finger. And I didn't even get to tell you when I met uh, Buzz Aldrin. The, uh, oh, well, let's talk about that background. real quick. Let's, let's, let's make some time for that if you have time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, we were, we were talking about Edgar Mitchell and, and the astronauts. So about 15 years ago, I was at a travel conference and there's Buzz Aldrin. And of course, a lot of people wanted him to sign his signature. And I just sort of kind of lurked around, uh, waited for a, an opportunity. And so he started walking the floor and I was just kind of parallel and I'm real tall and he's kind of medium height. And, and at a point he just stopped in the aisle and he kind of looked at me and he's like, yeah, wh what are you uh, following me around for? And I said, well, really proud to have this opportunity to talk to you, you're a great American hero, you know, kind of. Butter him up <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> rubbed him a little bit yeah yeah yeah. warmed him up uh and i said is it true that on the return flight that the capsule was followed by and and even entered by orbs and this is one of the the great mysteries of the apollo 11 mission is that they not only saw the big cities on the back side of the moon and in my book future esoteric I have a quote where they use the code word Santa Claus, meaning they saw the cities, they saw the craft. And in fact, several craft landed on the edge of the crater when they landed in the Sea of Tranquility is what it's called, the area where the Apollo 11 touched down. And then on the return flight, they were followed by these orbs. Well, Buzz Aldrin has these piercing blue eyes and, and he just looked at me and he's like, he didn't confirm it. He didn't deny it. But the way he looked at me is like, how did you know that? And so this is about 15, 20 years ago when really people weren't talking about it that much. But if you went up to Buzz Aldrin with a Bible and said, do you swear on the Bible you went to not. the moon? There are videos of him punching people out. So this guy's got a bit of a temper and I certainly didn't want to. Uh, and he's, he's still a fit guy for what he's in his 90s now. Um, but uh, my feeling was at the time that they did have 
alien encounters on uh, the Apollo 11 voyage and subsequent voyages. And Edgar Mitchell, he started the uh, Noetic Sciences here in California in Petaluma. And I've spoken there on several occasions and, and have spoken to uh, the curators of, of Noetic Sciences. And they have said, yeah, oh, yeah, he was very vocal about um, opening this up into this extraterrestrial realm. You put the aliens in the middle of this stuff and you get all the answers. And uh, well, that's why they sent that's why they sent all those hard ass military guys on the Apollo missions. They right. didn't want scientists who would freak out and bottle it. They wanted guys who would just be like that's follow the orders no matter what. Right. Listen, yeah. Brad, I'm not going to let you go until you promise to come back because we've only I only feel like we've scratched the surface of what we could talk about. Oh so, we really have too. I really would like to come back and let's schedule that again. And you guys are great. Thanks for having me on. And Brad, thank, real thank quickly, you. can you tell everybody where, where uh, we can find your work? It's a fascinating body of work you put together and we'll make sure we link everything. But if you just want to drop your, your website or if you have a YouTube channel where people can find your work. Sure. Yeah. So if you want to know more about me and the projects I'm involved with and uh, my speaking engagements that have been canceled in 2022, you can go to bradolson.com. B R A D O L S E N dot com. Uh, all my books and other authors I publish, including Beyond Esoteric, can be found on cccpublishing.com. That's three C's in publishing, one word, dot com. And all the uh, books of mine that are ordered off of that website, this is the only way I'm able to uh, sign copies for people. So, um, oh. Well, we'll run, uh, during the whole show, we'll have that website address at the bottom. You also run a festival in San Francisco, I believe? Yes, that's right. I'm the founder and producer of the How Weird Street Fair in San Francisco. And, um, well, this whole scamdemic's thrown us for a curveball, and we're going to have to see how things play out for the rest of this year. But we'd love to come back, probably in the fall. Well, yeah, we'd love to join you. Yep. Yeah. Come on down. That'd be fantastic. So, uh, thanks, uh, thank you again, Brad Olson. Thank you, Tiff, uh, Timony, for setting this up. Two strikes. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, I'm under a lot of pressure. I'm, I'm working all the time. Uh, <laughs> and ma many, many more strings that look, you know, buy Brad's books, go visit his website, and many more strings to your bow, Brad. You're doing fantastic, fascinating work. And we'll see you all again next time on Beyond Room 313 Symposium. And look after yourselves, okay? Thank you Bye so now. much.